Hello everyone. I trust you've been encouraged so far in the service as you make your way through. I got a bit of bad news, which, well, you know about already, and a bit of good news. Here's the bad news. The bad news is we had to cancel our church weekend away. Um, yes, you probably knew that. Uh, I think it was going to be on next weekend, but due to COVID restrictions and all that sort of thing. The good news is our weekend away speaker, Jeff Lynn, who most of you would know, uh, Jeff has also just been appointed, by the way, the new senior minister at, um, at Holy Trinity Adelaide in the city of Adelaide, which is exciting. Uh, but he's agreed to record his weekend away sermons for us to watch over the next three weeks. Uh, the topic is guidance. And I know for many of us, uh, it's a bit of a hot topic, isn't it? How do we make God-honouring decisions? So make sure you tune in uh, this time, next week, uh, for, that, for part one of that series. Now, Jeff has also kindly offered to answer any of our questions from his talks, just like we would if he was preaching here on a Sunday or over a weekend away. What you need to do is you need to email in a question uh, to me, uh, email into me a question, and then I'll pass that on to, uh, to Jeff. He'll then record a video with his answers of those questions, and then we'll put that video in our service next week as a bit of a link to click on to, just like the sermon link that you've clicked on today. So that's really good news. I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, our time in God's Word together. And please keep checking your emails. I know you've probably got a flood of emails from the church. I'm, I'm sorry about that, but we're trying to keep in touch. Uh, keep checking your emails, and as I'll be writing very soon, confirming our return to face-to-face -face services, which is all really exciting, uh, give you a bit of an idea of what that will look like and dates and, and those types of things. Now, let's get our Bibles open again to the book of James. Uh, James chapter 4, picking up. Uh, things at verse 13 as we well we're going to close this series in James because of the cancellation of the weekend away and squeezing Jess talks in I've had to cut our series on James short by one so you're going to have to do the work on James chapter 5 yourself at home I think pray about it and uh, get stuck in how about we pray now and ask God to help us as we look at his word let's pray Father, we do thank you for your, your love for us in the Lord Jesus. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the practical uh, word that James is to us today. And so, Lord, help us to put into practice your words um, and build our house, our lives on the rock that is you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, um, an older couple on a busy day out uh, sat down for a break. That's better, she says. So crowded. Noisy too, he says, as she opens their neatly packed sandwiches. He asks, got a cheese one? Oh, it's nice to take the weight off your feet, isn't it, she says. Little do they know, as their feet are swept up from the ground and their bodies are strapped in, they've sat themselves in a roller coaster ride and are about to be thrown upside down, around and about, this way and that, and screaming ensues. <laughs> it is, of course, an ad for Specsavers. And the should have gone to Specsavers is the tagline. The, the scene closes with the couple walking away after the ride, walking away in shock. And the man says, he says, what sort of cheese was that? Uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's a great ad. And there's a whole series of them too. You should watch them. Um, you look them up on YouTube. But with a good pair of glasses, you see things clearly. You see the world around you clearly. Uh, you don't mistake a roller coaster seat for a park bench. You see things in perspective, the way they ought to be seen. Now, today's passage, 4 verse 13 to 5 verse 11, is about the implications of seeing the world through the lens of Jesus, seeing our world clearly in its, in it, in its right perspective. When we put our, uh, our Jesus glasses on, we might call this our Christian worldview, what are the implications for our lives? How is it different when we see things the way God wants us to see things? You see, there are warnings as well as promises in this section. James urges his readers to see the importance of allowing God and his values to shape our attitudes, to, especially when it comes to, to business, uh, to, to money, and to the poor, which has been a, a common theme in James, hasn't it? So James begins this section 
in fact, uh, he, or by saying, and he writes this phrase twice in 4 verse 13 and 5 verse 1, he begins this section by saying, now listen, back in my teaching days, um, I might have said to a rowdy class, oi, something like that, or maybe, um, quiet now, three, two, one, the countdown seems to always work, um, I might have clicked my fingers, or it works pretty well too, or brought out the old classic, it's not, to- it's not my time you're wasting. Um, in fact, that was, that was a lie. It was my time. It was, we went into recess. It was my time. Thanks very much. Anyway, uh, James is a bit like a cranky teacher to a class that's not listening. So he says, now listen, now listen. He addresses three groups, the upwardly mobile, that's chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. Uh, second, the rich oppressors, 5, verses 1 to 6. And third, he finishes off with these, the faithful who are oppressed, Christians who are oppressed. That's in 5, 7 to 11. So first, now listen, you upwardly mobile, verses 13 to 17, chapter 4. Now we used to, we used to call such people yuppies. Uh, I'm not sure that entirely fits here, and it's a bit of a dated term anyway. But back in James's day, his readers would have known exactly what type of person James was referring to when he quotes them who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or to that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. These people were merchants or traders and they were the upwardly mobile. And in the first century Roman Empire, they were riding a wave of great success in materialism and, well, decadence really. They were des- they were, they were as, as desperate for the dollar as any yuppie today, or, or whatever we call them these days. Now, there's nothing wrong with having an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, think back to the, the woman of Proverbs 31, who's, who's um, praised for her business uh, sense. The, the problem is these merchants, especially the successful ones, were prone to arrogance and pride due to their success. You can imagine their smugness you know, as they leave the plebs in their wake, uh, landing another great deal. So to all this, what does James say? James responds by putting their lives in perspective. Look at verse 14 with me if you've got a Bible in front of me. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. James sees things clearly. He gets the the right perspective. He sees the world through the lens of Jesus. Of course, stock could get damaged. Merchandise could be raided on the highway to Ephesus. Our clients could choose to shop elsewhere and find a cheaper deal. It could all fall apart. Our lives, even the successful ones, are simply a mist, appearing and disappearing without a trace. Again, it's almost as if James is quoting his brother. Uh, Jesus says to the rich fool in Luke 12, who stores up for himself an abundance of possessions. This is the passage that Sophie read so well for us. You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? You see, because of the uncertainty of life, James says believers should think and act as those who live under the rule of God, not under the reign of money. We should say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live or do this or that. That is, you see, it's a healthy safeguard for Christians. It's nothing superstitious. Let's get out that out of your head for a minute. And it's not some sort of weird legalistic requirement that you've got to say at the end of every sentence. It's about keeping our aspirations in check. It's about keeping us humble. These merchants were the aspirational class of, of the times. They longed for more wealth and constantly made plans to achieve it. Today, friends, this is it's really the norm, isn't it? Really. Uh, being... Ambitious to be wealthy is our default setting. We cry out for just a little more status, more travel, more comfort, more money. Now, there's nothing nothing wrong with being wealthy, but the pride that often goes with it of, of personal success, there's the problem. Instead, James says he urges us to live by if it's the Lord's will. Everything comes from God's hand. Everything, everything I do, 
my sleeping, my waking, my earning, my breathing is a gift from God. Everything we have, everything we do is a gift from God. James's point is that we should think, act and talk as if we know that. Any hoped for achievement should come with God willing. Again, not as some superstitious cliche, but as something that keeps our aspirations in check. To keep, to keep us viewing our world in the right perspective, that we live under his rule, not the rule of the dollar. Now, James has been speaking to believers up to this point, uh, verses 13 to 17, these upwardly mobile merchants who have got things a bit muddled, uh, they've got things out of perspective. But in 5 verses 1 to 6, the next paragraph, he turns his attention to these rich oppressors. Again, he says, now listen, oi, uh, now listen, you rich oppressors. It, it, was, uh, it was strong language before in the end of chapter 4, uh, chapter 4. Now he turns it up to 11. Have a look at verse 1 with me of chapter 5. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. James is basically telling these people to go to hell. Uh, but why such language? Well, the answer has to do with the style of writing or what literary nerds call literary genre. Uh, like today, we understand there's a whole bunch of different styles of writing. Reading the news is different than reading a cartoon or reading satire or reading the TV guide. Now, the Bible also has a variety of literary styles or genres and we read each of them differently. So... Well, there's history, there's poetry, there's parables and letters, there's ap um, apocalyptic. And also a style known as prophetic lament. Um, quoting a helpful book I've been reading through this series, uh, prophetic lament is where a biblical prophet publicly denounces an oppressor without any expectation that the bad guy will actually take notice of his words. They are intended for the oppressed, not the oppressor. You see, this is the writer's way of saying, hang in there. Help is on the way. God will overthrow the tyrant. He's speaking to the oppressed. He said, that's keeping things in perspective, seeing clearly, says James. So James 5, 1 to 6 is classic uh, prophetic lament. It's not, a, it's not a warning to the rich oppressors in the church. There probably weren't any. No, it was meant to comfort those who were oppressed. And, and there were probably quite a few of them. The crimes of the rich and greedy, well, they're listed pretty well, aren't they, in verses 3 to 6. They have hoarded wealth, they're living in luxury and self-indulgence, and, and they've done this at the expense of the poor, uh, the innocent ones, verse 6 refers to, withholding wages from their field workers, who no doubt would have lived day to day, they would have lived pay packet by pay packet. But injustice like this does not go unnoticed. Have a look at verse 4 with me. The cries of these harvesters have reached the ears of God, the ears of the Lord Almighty. Rich oppressors, watch out. Watch out. What is coming your way is not good, as verse 1 and 2 make very clear. James is reassuring the oppressed that God's justice is on the way. You see, like many times in our Bibles, God's judgment is a promise of a loving God to oppressed humanity that he hears their cry for justice and will one day bring his justice to bear on every act of cruelty, on every act of bullying, on every act of abuse, oppression. Friends, we live in a world of appalling injustice. Every now and then we get a glimpse of it when some celebrity, say, is convicted of sex trafficking, profiteering or profiting from the misery of teenage girls or an abusive husband takes out his family uh, and then dis in despicable cowardness turns the gun on himself. But these are just glimpses. 
If we scratch the surface every day in every country, oppression and tyranny are widespread. And that's why there's a judgment day. But look, we're not to have some morbid fascination uh, with punishment or to take pleasure in the thought of others suffering under God's wrath. That's not what we're meant to do. Uh, we actually thank God for Judgment Day because we long for him to make right what is so wrong. James teaches us to give thanks for the coming judgment because on that day the Lord's compassion and mercy towards wounded humanity, those abused teenage girls, the victims of domestic violence and so on, on that day God's compassion and mercy will be fully known. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, be patient. There is comfort for God's people. And this is the final section in verses 7 to 11. Have a look at verse 7 with me. Be patient, therefore, then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient, stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. There are... There, there aren't many professions, I don't think, that are more patient than the humble farmer. Uh, maybe you could argue teachers, I don't know. Um, Stay-at-home mums or dads, very patient in my book. Um, but farmers must have patience with their crop, their livestock, their equipment, and most of all, the weather. They've got to wait for the weather, the rains to come. Who else could wait for months for their crop with the hope that it would turn into something? Likewise, believers are to wait for God's day of justice, like the farmer who waits for the changing seasons, who waits for the land to yield its valuable crops. It, it, all this, it stands in contrast, doesn't it, to the instant gratification world that we live in. Uh, I like this cartoon. Um, the, the protest leader yells to the crowd, What do we want? The crowd shouts back, Instant gratification. When do we want it? The crowd shouts, Now! Um, <laughs> But friends, God's word tells us it's worth waiting. Be patient. It's worth waiting. It's worth hanging in there. It's worth being patient. God's justice is coming. We need to trust him. Verse 8, we had to wait for the Lord's coming, a standing firm in Jesus, standing firm in his promises, in his word. In practice, well, this means, for example, we don't grumble or groan about each other. See verse 9? Don't let the pressure of difficult circumstances cause you to have a go at each other. Uh, instead, stand firm in God's promises. There's a great lesson there for us, isn't it? As we deal with all this COVID stuff going around, talk about vaccinations and so on. Don't let the pressure of difficult circumstances cause you to have a go at each other. Instead, well, stand firm in Jesus. Love each other. Well, the example of Job is mentioned in terms of patience in verses 10 and 11. But in the end, the basis of our hope and patience is God's character, which we find in the last phrase of verse 11. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. In this context, God's compassion and mercy is, is shown in his overthrow of oppressors and the rescue of the oppressed. Well, friends, if you're a Christian, this is your worldview. Seeing things clearly, seeing, seeing the world in its right perspective, the way God wants us to see things. It's a vision of real and certain hope of promises kept, uh, not under the reign of money, but under the rule of God, knowing the comfort that God's justice brings and be patient, standing firm in God's promises for the Lord's coming is near. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your word to us today. We thank you for the encouragement and the comfort we have that, Lord, you will one day make things that are so wrong and that you'll make them right. Lord, help us to be patient. Help us to trust you. And, Lord, we pray that we won't live under the reign of money. Uh, we know that our lives are, are short, really, in the scheme of things. And so help us not to lose perspective. Lord, thank you for your word today. Uh, thank you for our church. And we pray, Lord, that um, we can put your words into practice. In Jesus' name, amen.